I'm already getting the Black Friday emails, you know, we're like two, three weeks out and they're like, all right, now it's Black November. Right, yeah. <laughs> but the interesting thing with this year, I think, um, is that it's really become Black Friday season in that, mm, right. you know, it's not just the day or the week, like Cyber Monday is not like, people still reference that even though it's like antiquated. Don't buy anything the first two weeks of November because you're gonna get a discount on something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Without a Roadmap. This is a podcast for product folks who don't have all the answers. My name is Jonas Dinkna, joined here by my co-host, Cameron Curry. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode two of the Customer Success 101 series. Today, we're joined by a very, very special guest, uh, Erica Ayat. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Woo! I got yeah. the, I got the <laughs> sign. <laughs> she is the VP of Customer Success at Privy. Um, super uh, interested in company, especially around this time, given the holiday season is now upon us. It seems like 2020 has been a long and short year at the same time. So, time has been a weird thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. So, Erica, how about you just start us off with uh, just telling us a little bit about yourself, um, what you do at Privy, obviously the VP of Customer Success, and then also maybe hit on some of your past experiences that led you up into uh, Privy. Yeah, sure. So, so I've been in tech for about 16 years. And like you said, I'm the VP of success at Privy. So um, I have the success, the onboarding and the support teams in my, in my little uh, empire, I guess you could say. <laughs> um, and I really, I started off my career as a marketer, um, which surprises some folks. So I did that for about nine, 10 years. And then I got into sales and success and uh, never looked back. And it's been, it's been really helpful having that kind of a background because, you know, a lot of my experience and the companies I've worked at have been very uh, focused on, on, on MarTech or in e-commerce. So to have that sort of background and that subject matter expertise is, um, has been helpful for me um, as a, in, in my different customer success roles. And it's something I certainly look for when, when building a team. But, um, but yeah, like super excited to, to be with you guys today. I know uh, Jonas and I have had other conversations and other contexts before, so I'm glad to uh, join him again. And I, um, yeah, I'm just excited and looking forward to the conversation. Awesome, yes. So excited to have you. Erica and Privy, also parlor customer, which is amazing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I, I, I was hoping to start things off similar to our first episode. We're currently in this customer success 101 series, trying to learn the ins and outs of, you know, success uh, role from the people who are running it and, and the companies that we're, we're all familiar with. So the first question we like to ask is, what is customer success to you? Ooh, this is my one of my favorite questions. And Customer, I always like to say this, customer success um, is, isn't just a function of a company, but it should be an operating principle across an entire organization. The organization should be, and it's amazing sometimes how much a, a, a company might not be focused on customer, right? Um, and I think that's a, a trap that a lot of, especially like earlier stage startups can get into. They're really focused on their next customer instead of the one that they have now and making them successful. So um, I think we've seen that some of the most successful companies are the ones that really take customer success organization wide to heart. And they're all working uh, towards that, towards that goal. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's, Customer success is easier done when you have like the the CEO of, or all the management team already bought in from the beginning. So, for example, always easier when you have buy in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> always so, easier. <laughs> have you seen or have you heard or just maybe just throughout your your network and other uh, things you keep it up to date on is like is for companies that aren't bought in or aren't really focused on customer success. Maybe they have their own function that's kind of just operating, but there's not really at much focus on it. Like there's not that operational uh, buy-in. Yeah. Like, how do you see like the transition for, for that? Like, how, like what's, have you seen like a turning point where something yeah. happens in the company all of a sudden it was like, oh, we need to focus on customer success. We need to do this, that, and like, we need to scale the team. Like, have you right. seen customers like turn or <laughs> Yeah, well, either that, like you have a sort of like, like the, the killing of the dinosaurs moment when everyone's like, oh, what's going on? And the customer people are like, oh, I told you so. No, but, or, <laughs> or I think a lot of times I see like customers finally figure out what their product market fit is. And they're like, oh, 
that's that's the key here. Like we're matching the customer intent and and you know solving the problem of the customer with what's actually going on, you know, in the software. Um, and so I think that's also an inflection point as well. So it could be from a, a, a spot of positivity or a spot of negativity, but either way, you know, eventually a lot of those companies come around. Um, and I think it's hard, right? Like when you are trying to scale a startup or trying to scale a company, I mean, a, a lot of the focus is always on uh, the rate of growth, right? And usually, you know, it, it, early stage investors or whatever are, are looking at that top line, but it's like, you know, there's math here. There's a bottom line as well. And you have mm. to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. so eventually, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of companies do get there. I wish they would get there earlier or maybe have that perspective from the start, but I understand where that tension comes from. Mm -hmm. I think another question to follow on that is, when you, when you, like in your opinion, when do you think like the first customer success hire should be hired if they're, if it's like not one of the founders doing that already? Um, and then how would you go about building your customer success function and maybe talk about how it's currently structured within Privy as well? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's going to be different for every organization. And I think um, some of the differences come into play with the, the type of, um, you know, if you're, if you're addressing an SMB market versus mm -hmm. mid market versus enterprise, you know, if you are enterprise to mid market, you probably want someone on the customer success side sooner rather than later. If you are at least starting out as something that's more SMB focused or more uh, self-serve focused, I think, you know, what you probably want to do is build a really strong foundation of a support organization and then look at your, your customer base see what, you know, your customer, like see what sort of segment might warrant more of a, a CS resource there. So I think, I think it depends on the market that you're addressing, um, first of all. And I can tell you from Privy's perspective, so just as a, a little bit of background, I joined Privy almost three years ago now. Um, and at the time we were a 12 person company. So I was lucky number 13. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, you know, we had a few folks in support and no one else in CS. And, and now uh, between um, success, uh, onboarding and support, we have a 23 person. Nice. Version. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it hasn't looked the same over time. I, I, I didn't come in with like, okay, here's the monolithic vision. And I know that this is what we're going to do year one and year two and year three. It really had to evolve and we had to adapt over time. So um, from a CS perspective, what we started with was our highest, like the cream of the crop in terms of, um, you know, the, our, our, our highest value customers, meaning the customers who were spending the most money. Mm -hmm. yeah. We decided to address them first. And then as we started to build more resources into the team, we were able to come further down that that segment and apply one-to-one -one resources to customers who were spending less with us because you know we were able to grow the team we were able to prove out the value of that one-to-one mm. -one resource or on the you know the support side what extended hours additional channels additional languages um would be able to do for our for our entire customer base and it really evolved over time so the rules of play in the playbook that we had in 2018 are very different than what we mm. have now and that's just because their business has changed a lot in three years mm. and how do you kind of chart, chart out the success of your team or you know warrant growing that team is it purely oh we have too many customers and we need more people <laughs> or it's like hey we can look at these like indicators that uh, point to customer success leading to you know business growth or you know any other kind of upward trajectory and, you know, metrics that you care about, you know, is there a way that you're able to really point to a business success and tie that to the work that a CS org is doing? Yeah, for sure. And, and, and I don't think most CS organizations start out there because, you know, the, the ultimate indicator is retention, but that's a lagging indicator, right? You might not know for a right. whole year, right? Yeah. <laughs> <If the laughs> exactly. Customers that you were working with, or, you know, if, if you have annual contracts, if you do month to month, obviously that's a little bit different. Um, but, but some of the things that we look at certainly are, or, or one of the things I think to figure out sooner rather than later is your health scoring, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously there, there are a lot of things that go into that. Um, there's, there's a lot, <laughs> right. As you guys know, there's, there's product use, there's engagement with the brand. There is, um, you know, sometimes it's the, 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 the sentiment of the CS person who's working with the customer that can say like, 
you know, it's it, it, in that way, it's sort of like, um, like, like pipeline, um, op, like opportunity scoring from like a sales right. pipeline. It's sort of just the other side of the coin. Um, I think the one thing that, you know, we really focus on at Privy that I think is n- not as uh, common is the success outcomes for the customer. And what I mean by that is, you know, with, with our tool, you know, we can see how many sales, we can see the dollar amount that our product has helped our merchants uh, earn. Mm-hmm. Right? And so that's a very direct, like, oh, this is having an impact on the customer. And, you know, it, it's partly due to the nature of our tool, but at the end of the day, that's what they care about. Like, right. <laughs> you, know, it, you know, we might say, well, yay, they like, they're logging in every day, but like from a customer perspective, maybe they're logging into a product every day because like they can't figure out what the heck is going on. Like that's, yeah. not, like, <laughs> you know, like we can assign good and bad to some behaviors, but that's not necessarily the customer perspective. So as much as your product enables you to align customer health with what the customer outcome actually is for them, not for you, <laughs> I think is the, the best way to measure health. So anyway, that's all to say, like, if you need leading indicators, getting that down first, I think is really helpful. And just know that it might change over time. Like we, our health scoring has changed, right? The, the, it's, it's a bit of alchemy, right? It's like, okay, like I'm going to guess, because essentially you're making a guess when you first create it. Like yeah. this is, this is, these are the behaviors. These are the, whatever that I think is green yellow red or like on a spectrum of you know good to bad um, mm-hmm. and then you just have whatever to that means time. what did you say yes? what, whatever that means yeah we do right. that. <laughs> green yellow red it's like a, I mean, yeah. you just gotta put a stake in the ground and then say okay yeah. is it getting better or worse does this make sense or not okay like let's move from there mm-hmm. right? so um i think that's an interesting point in like tying um the health to the actual success outcomes of things um that leads me to ask like do you think so the way that customer health scores I don't, I don't know too much about it so forgive my my questions but from the way the way i've uh read about it is that it's like the health scores for every uh it's like universal for all accounts all your customers would you say it could be beneficial to have um, individual health scores for accounts or is that too granular in the weeds because people might have different success outcomes that you want to hit towards um, yeah. So it could be beneficial to have like custom outcomes for specific individuals. Yeah, that, that's a really great question. So what we do is that we, uh, the way that we design our scoring is that we do it by tier. So we say like, okay, basically if you're spending X amount of dollars, you should be getting X amount of value out. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily monolithic. Um, it, it also too, if, you know, if you're spending more money, the idea is that maybe you're more of a mature business versus a business that's just starting out, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So there is some customization that we do currently. um, But to your point, Cameron, the success is very different to every customer, which is why health scoring is important, but it is not the only only thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's why the the strength of your relationships and having – having someone in CS, right, is very important because they can give context where maybe right. health score can. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, so going back to your point about starting off in marketing, um, mm-hmm. I, 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 one of the things that came up in our episode last week with uh, Nikki, uh, who's the director of success at Link Squares, was the importance of domain expertise mm-hmm. for CSNs and how that plays a role in the, the ways that you can kind of support and, and understand your customers so that you can, you know, push them towards the outcomes that they desire. Uh, so I'm curious, what is it, how does, how has your background in marketing impacted uh, your role at, uh, at Privy? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it really, it's the thing that got me into success in the first place, not at Privy, but at another company, I had actually been a customer when I had been a marketer and then they said, Hey, do you want to help us on the other side of things? And I was like, Oh my God, talk to people face to face. That's not, how can I do that? That's not what marketers do, but um, <laughs> I figured it out. <laughs> hopefully. And um, it was just, I, I figured out that, you know, um, it was a lot of fun to be able to talk about something that I was passionate about and that 
um, you know, I had some expertise in. So, you know, same thing with Privy. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, more e-commerce flavored, but certainly a lot of the same principles apply when it comes to the, the technology and some of like the best practices and principles. And that's certainly things that we, we look for when hiring. Um, that I think the, the issue of domain expertise is uh, a great one to talk about, right? Because I think sometimes customer success can get a bad rap where it's just, you know, if you just have folks who like, hey, we're going to teach you what the best practices are, and then they kind of parrot that to their customer, and it doesn't seem very intuitive or customized or, you know, I think you can overcome some of those things with a really great training program, mm -hmm. um, you know, both from a strategic perspective and from a product perspective, because that's, I think, another thing a lot of success people get, uh, you know, uh, can fall into a trap where they don't know the product as well as they should. Um, that really annoys me. So like everyone on my team is a product expert, but like, um, it's like, you're helping them with the product. You should know how it works. Um, right. <laughs> exactly. you, know, you know, but I do think it's really important because it just, it makes the, uh, the guidance and the coaching that you're giving those customers so much more real, right? Because you can draw on your subset of knowledge and your experience and you can apply it, even if it's not one-to-one, -one, right? Like we have a lot of folks on our team who had, uh, marketing experience, but not specifically e-commerce, but guess what? They were familiar with, you know, you know, email tools and how mm -hmm. these work and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So that was a great background. So they can have those conversations at a much deeper level. It creates a lot of trust with the customer and it really, you know, puts you in that, to use a, a, a well-worn phrase, puts you in that role of trusted advisor because you can actually give real advice and, and right. problem solve in real time. So, right. Yeah. So Kim and I are both uh, customer success managers to a degree. We, we work very closely with our, our customers. And uh, part of the reason it's been set up that way is because like exactly like you said, that domain expertise and, you know, just being able, you know, people having, uh, you know, a sense of comfort and that you can speak their language is super important. And the fact that we sell primarily to, you know, originally product teams, now more and more customer facing teams, you know, us being able to speak the language is really important. And I, I think that's part of the reason why we wanted to have the CS 101 uh, podcast this is this is you know free coaching uh, you know as free we, knowledge <laughs> yeah, free, yeah. <laughs> as, as we work more and more with these customer facing teams it's going to be important that we um, understand the ins and outs of, of everything they do so uh, we appreciate you for contributing to our uh, education fund here sure and, and I do think that you know customer success as as you know it's like sort of exploding as a as a role yeah. and career option um, and you know, early days, right, in other, you know, maybe more enterprise-focused organizations, they had account managers, right, and those, I think that's sort of where some of the customer success DNA comes from, and a lot of those folks were either very, like, commercially focused or very relationship-focused, and so I think sort of that legacy where maybe, like, the first generation of customer success managers kind of came out of that school where they were dealing with larger customers, they didn't necessarily need to have a lot of the expertise because they were focused on different goals. But when you think about, you know, rephrasing that and, and, and re, um, reimagining the role as customer success, like, oh, you're responsible for me. I mean, <laughs> making the customer successful. So there's other pieces here, right? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it should be obvious, right? But like, <laughs> time, like there's, it's like, oh, like there's other pieces here rather than just like, I'm just gonna make you feel good you know, right. with the problems, it's like, actually, I have to problem solve with you, I have to co-create with you. Mm -hmm. would, would you say that there's, a, there's still a common misconception about the difference between account managers and customer success managers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> could, could you, <laughs> let, let's go a little bit deeper there and mm -hmm. maybe explain to us and, and everybody else listening what the difference is in your opinion. Yeah, well, well, the different, like, it, it's different, it's going to be different at every organization. And I think right. at like I was saying, at legacy organizations, at organizations that are dealing with more uh, enterprise clients, those terms are sort of interchangeable. Mm -hmm. But we're now coming into, um, I think more organizations are now differentiating between the roles if they have both. So in some instances, you know, like at Privy, the customer success manager also is the commercial owner as well, meaning they deal with contracts and billing and all that and all that kind of stuff. It's some organizations, typically they're a little bit larger, 
typically they are servicing mid-market to enterprise customers. They're differentiating the roles where the customer success manager is, you know, they own the relationship and they own a lot of the product knowledge and they own the strategy, but the account manager owns the commercial side of it. So the renewals, for example. And, and, and sometimes that accounts team will live within customer success and sometimes, oh, and they also own, you know, upsell, cross-sell, that like, expansion yep. as well. Um, and sometimes that team will still live in sales. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad way to go, um, just because if you are the one who is making that customer successful, if you are the one who owns the relationship, like, not that it has to be, but it can be then awkward to turn around and talk about money. Right. Um, <laughs> which, like, some people can do it. Like, I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> like, <I'm good>. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it, it can be, and, and if you think of the individuals, right, who are drawn to customer success, they are more relationship focused. They are more um, about coming to a solution, whereas some of the commercial side that, that sometimes fits more naturally in sales. And sometimes it's good to have a little bit of a separation between church and state. So I think it just depends on the organization. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't think there's like a hundred percent wrong or right way to go with that. There's just a little bit of difference now. Yeah. Or there should be. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely don't like uh, playing that upsell cross sell role within the relationship um, with customers, but um, somebody's got to do it. You can finesse. You must be good at it. Yeah, that, well, you know what? If you're coming from, I know it makes some people uncomfortable, but like if you're coming from a place of like, you know, this actually is going to help you in like, it's, it's, I also think, let me just say this too, like it depends on how the uh, success manager, the account manager is compensated for um, expansion early. So mm. I always say, so on they our, do that? Uh, sorry. They do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they should. They should. If, you want, if, the, if, if your company wants expansion revenue, then you should probably, you know, uh, uh, reward folks for that. However, <laughs> the way that it's done within a success organization shouldn't be the same way that it's done in a sales organization. So if you have an account manager role, you know, that is differentiated from the customer success role, they probably have a quota or they mm -hmm. probably have a goal that they're reaching, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> from a success standpoint, what we do is we have a, uh, variable goals based on uh, gross retention, but then we have a SPIF structure for expansion revenue. So mm -hmm. the majority, so the, I think that to me is a way to appropriately goal in a way that's very more, it's more customer centric, right? It's not mm -hmm. just like, all right, minus this revenue plus that revenue equals yeah. gold. It's more like, all right, let's make all the customers like successful, right? But it also, so, and it also rewards folks for that expansion revenue, but it's not like you must, you know, hit fifteen percent. Right. So in that way, if you are, if those sort of expansion revenue conversations are a little bit easier because you know, as the success manager that like, you're only going to bring it up if it's really right for the customer, mm -hmm. if it's really going to help them, because guess what? You sold it, you bought it, you know, or they bought it <laughs> and you have to help them. So you're not going to like sell yeah. them something that is not going to be helpful for them because you're responsible for it at the end of the day. So it's a way of both rewarding and encouraging expansion revenue, but I think in a way that is customer centric. Mm. We're going to have to look into that. <laughs> <laughs> Bring me okay. after I can. <laughs> you, can you, you can throw in a, a good word for <laughs> um, it. It's for, um, we started off earlier saying that um, I think onboarding customer success and maybe a third uh, support. Yeah. Support. They make up, they make up your empire at Privy. Uh, talk to us about the onboarding process for new customers mm -hmm. at Privy. I think that'd be super interesting mm -hmm. to, to add to our, uh, our knowledge bank that you're. Yeah. Into. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'll, uh, I have to differentiate a little bit. So we have a, a customer success team and an onboarding team. And for us, there is an onboarding state if you have a customer success manager, mm -hmm. but our onboarding team actually addresses a different tier of customers. Got it. So if you, you know, spend a certain amount of money, you get a customer success manager and then they, you know, they take you through an onboarding process. And then they're also the, 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 the person who sticks with you throughout your entire, you know, journey with you, which a lot of organizations 
for the same customer, the same tier of customer, have different folks on board, and then they pass them off to CS. Mm-hmm. And I hate that. <laughs> and the reason why I hate that is because you're already getting a transfer from sales, typically. And so it's like a game of telephone. It's like, all right, customers coming in from sales, they do onboarding, and then they yeah. move in. And then like as a customer, right, you're like, who the heck am I supposed to talk to? Like, I don't right. remember. Yeah. And then like, you know, there's a knowledge transfer every time you're transferring knowledge. It like, you know, there's something lost. Um, and I think it's good for the success person, even though, you know, if you're, it can, it can feel like a little rote, I guess, if you're doing the same type of training, but if you're doing it right, it's going to be different anyway. So sorry, that's like, I had to get up on my little soapbox about that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. People should do onboarding. That's an easier way to say it. Okay. Um, <laughs> And so, and then we have an onboarding team that addresses, um, that's a, it's a limited relationship. It's still one-to-one, but it's, you know, a series of one to say three calls that, you know, that team works with a certain segment of customers, gets them off on the right foot. And then, you know, later on that team uh, will get like priority support, but it's a a limited time sort of conversation or a limited time engagement, I should say. Um, So, so the onboarding process um, in either case, the first call, you say like you have with the customer is all about understanding, you know, what are they trying to do? Uh, How was the best way to get them there? And for us, it's all about like activation, right? What are the thing, like the goal for most of these calls is like, can we go live either with an email or an onsite campaign or whatever it is by the end of the call, we've helped them enough. You know, we get them to a point it's like co-creation. We might have some things built out in their dashboard for them, but the goal is to get to live by the end of the call, because we know if we can get them to get the product turned on, they're going to start seeing sales. They're going to start seeing more people, you know, growing in their email list. We know that's going to happen. And so the challenge is to get them to a point where it's like, they understand what's going on. They're excited to turn it on. And it's like, let's go. You just bought this thing. Like, Let's start, you know, right, yeah. some ROI here, right? Um, and so it's it's a combination of um, training from a product perspective, uh, training from a strategy perspective, and we try and keep that as, um, you know, we try not to overcomplicate things there. Um, it's like get the beautiful basics first, number mm-hmm. one, you know, and we've defined what those are. And then in subsequent calls, right, it's like, okay, you're doing that. We have some data that's working well, maybe we got to change something over here. Let's layer in some other things that maybe can, um, you know, just take you to that, to that next step and you can derive more value out of the, the tool set. But we try and, you know, like I said, we have the beautiful basics, the idea is to go live with the beautiful basics as soon as we can, and then sort of build on that from there. And for some customers, especially if it's a, a really small business, we don't, try and overcomplicate where it's not necessary, right? Some customers have really, um, you know, I don't want to say like crazy ass, but like they can, they can um, come to us with some really interesting problems that they're trying to solve or some interesting, um, you know, experiences on site that they're trying to replicate and we can like work with them through that. Mm -hmm. Um, And for those folks, that's great. But like other folks, it's like, hey, let's like, there's no reason to get overly complex here. This is working. Great. Want to do some A/B tests? Great. We can just sort of refine in that way. Um, so I think it's ma- it's also matching the the um, you have to match your customer, right? In terms of like what's going to work for them and be mm-hmm. practical about it. Mm-hmm. So one of the things you were mentioning about like going live on day one to me as a product person that that sounds like a, a north star metric you know it's mm-hmm. you know this is you know I, I forget what the facebook you know famous facebook one is like get seven friends in you know five days or something like that you know mm-hmm. and that's gonna that's gonna be uh, you know should we get them to that point they're gonna realize value and be much more likely to you know retain as a customer or as a user mm-hmm. uh, I'm, I'm curious like how is the customer success organized organization able to kind of influence the product direction, um, you know, because it's in everything is in your hands in the onboarding process. And like we all, as we all know, it's super important that you have a successful onboarding process for kind of the future retention of a customer. So, you know, in that process, I'm sure there's tons that you're learning and, you know, how are you transitioning or passing off this information to the product team so they can kind of continue to refine and make sure that the product kind of holds up to the standards expected by, you know, the CS team and obviously the customers. Yeah. I mean, that is a huge part of 
you know, what customer success leaders should be doing, right? Because, you know, we're, we're the canaries in the coal mine, right? Like we're hearing like all of this information from customers and maybe, you know, like, like Privy has, we, um, you know, what we're saying is often backed up by what, you know, customers are putting into parlor themselves while they're going through the process. So whenever we see one of those come through Slack, we're like, Yes, that's what we've been saying. Great. <laughs> yes, for go on, your, go on the private Slack channel, like, yes, we told them. <laughs> yeah, like, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Everyone's happy, right? Like, <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so there's that part of it, which is super important, right? And having, you know, whatever, whatever your voice of the customer program looks like, whether it's as simple as something like utilizing Parler or, you know, highlighting customer stories or if it's something more complex. So some of the things that we do, um, is every week in a couple of different forums, we highlight customer use cases. So um, every week we have a, a weekly update that lives on our wiki and we say, hey, these are like the, the, you know, we usually have some sort of a theme around, oh, this was this type of campaign or this type of email. And we'll highlight those use cases uh, to the rest of the organization. The other thing that we've found is really, has been really effective um, is, you know, keeping track of feature requests, like honestly, we have a spreadsheet. Like, <laughs> it's not super complex. Like when it's from a, a managed customer, we keep track of all those feature requests. And of course, there's a whole um, system of bug reporting and all that kind of stuff within our support organization that we use. And so we take that information and we have a meeting with our product team. And we include sales in this because having their voice in there is really helpful because they can often echo what we're saying. Um, what they're hearing in their, um, you know, in their meetings with prospects. And we say like, hey, these are the things that we're hearing. Um, and then we work with our product team to say like, hey, these are either bugs or feature requests, like let's prioritize them. Um, and um, so, so that's been really helpful having a, a working relationship there. The other trick I'll say is, um, you know, when you're highlighting those customer use cases, whatever forum that takes at your company, maybe it's Slack, maybe there's a, you know, team show and tell meeting, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, if you use a call recording software like Gong, mm -hmm. there is nothing better to get people's attention than to actually hear what the customer is saying in their own words, right? And I think that's one thing that customer success teams often take for granted because we're the ones who are like hearing this from customers. We're the ones who have to problem solve. So we can hear the urgency. We can hear the need, right? And sometimes I think if you're not customer facing, it's, it, it's just not as visceral. Right. Mm -hmm. But as a customer team, as soon as you say like, Hey, this is the use case and here, let me play you a clip of what the customer said. And you can hear it in their own words. It lands like nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, it's like frustrating from a customer. Like, Cause you're like, I could be saying this and give you all these examples. But like, as soon as people hear from a customer directly, they're like, Oh, and you're like, yes, this is what I do every day times 10, you know? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But that, that piece has been really helpful. So when you can, match, I guess my overarching thesis would be like have the data, right? Have your tickets for feature requests coming from support, have your, um, you know, be able to, oh, one thing I forgot to mention too is like uh, churn coding, uh, reason coding churn. So like, you know, obviously lagging indicator, but if you, uh, whether people are self-selecting their churn or they're going through your customer success manager, knowing the reason why they're churning mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is really important. So like using that data, along with your feature request data, your bug data, and then also the customer examples and like the in their own words stuff, I think really marries the qualitative with the quantitative and just gives the rest of the organization a really good view into, you know, what the, 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 the hearts and minds of your customers. Mm. Yeah, one thing I've heard recently was that it's super important to actually share what the customer said if it's in written form verbatim rather than try and summarize it. Because, yep. <laughs> yeah, because you start to get down, go down the, the rabbit hole of, you know, prescribing something uh, before actually listening to the actual problem that they're sharing. So that's mm -hmm. that's really interesting. And that, that sounds like you guys have a great workflow and, you know, all of the different teams are involved. Um, you know, we have conversations with, <laughs> yeah, <at least. laughs> we have conversations with folks all the time and, and it's, it's generally a very disjointed process, you know, and trying to 
coalesce information from all the different channels where feedback comes in, whether it's the sales process, mm -hmm. customer support, customer success product uh, is, is a challenge that everybody's dealing with. So uh, I, I'm curious, like along the lines of that challenge, I'm curious why, um, you know, it seems like customer success and product teams some, seem to butt heads so much. Um, mm -hmm. like, uh, that's that's a common theme that we're hearing and you know from what i'm hearing it's about you know trying to present evidence around you know what customers are saying from a customer success standpoint to mm -hmm. the product team who's you know, willing to build anything you know is assuming that it's going to have a positive impact on the business um but you know customer success teams kind of coming at it from the standpoint of like hey no i'm working with this one customer and what they're saying is relevant yeah yeah hey you know what like that i think that is a is a common theme and let me just say it too, like I do not envy uh, product folks sometimes because you have, I think sometimes like competing um, uh, uh, responsibilities or, or, or competing parts, or not even competing, but like just different parts of the business that you're trying to influence, right? Like if you are trying to influence growth from a product perspective, like what you're building today or what your roadmap looks like might be different than what your current customers look like, especially if you're going through a change in product market fit, there can be some pain there. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, so, so I think that can happen because sometimes I'll say customer success folks can maybe be a too, be a little bit too myopic, right. About like, these are like, this is a huge deal to me because this is like my customer or, or there's one customer worth a ton of MRR. And it's like, well, as a product person, I imagine you have to sort of step back and say like, okay, is it really worth spending the calories on this thing? Even if we lose this customer, which sucks for that CSM and sucks for the business, but like, you know, it's sort of like a calories in calories out sort of thing. Like we just can't do that. Um, <clears throat> you know, and so I think, you know, what you decide to do has to be very evidence-based, right? On the other hand, knowing what I know about product folks, building something new and shiny and sexy <laughs> is a lot more appealing than like, hey, we're gonna fix these like 27 bugs. Who wants to jump in? <laughs> you, know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, so I think there's that part too. And, I, I, and like the bugs and like that sort of stuff is gonna be, those are often coming from current customers, right? And so, you know, if you have those, like, you know, responsibilities for both growth and retention, you know, on the product side, like I can, I can see where it can be really difficult to sort of, um, you know, weigh those options. And often, especially in high growth SaaS companies, growth is going to often, often wins, which is great because we need sales and we need to grow. But at the same time, you're like, if you get a leaky bucket problem. You're like, hey, right. <laughs> and you're sort of like jumping up, like, please, please, pay attention to a little puppy, you know? <laughs> so, so I think like what we were talking about before, having all the information and using data to, to, to uh, highlight the, the, the depth or breadth of a problem or a request, I think would be helpful. And you tell me actually, like, is that helpful? <laughs> like, and then like bring the real customer feedback into it. Um, and also the other thing that we do too is when, when we talk about like our, our um, churn reason coding, we do it by logo, but also by MRR. So we can say like, oh, like this reason here, which might be like part of the product, might be competitive, might be whatever. We can say, um, not only was that 20 customers, it was X thousand dollars, you know, and that's like, oh, when you put a dollar sign <laughs> yeah. next to these things and it's like, oh yeah, or maybe we should... So I think that can make it really real sometimes too. Yeah. yeah I was going to say um, maybe, maybe a couple last questions before we, we sign off today is I know in our, our pre-recording, we were just brainstorming some, some topics of trying to limit what we can talk about. Cause I feel like we could talk all day about this yeah. type of stuff. <laughs> uh, I think it was fascinating that you were talking about building a product story or theme when, when go approaching the product team, hey, we need to build X, Y, Z use case because this is the story it tells in our product and this is how it would help our mm -hmm. customers. So maybe talk a little bit about that process you do. Um, at yeah, yeah. So, so I think that's, and this is something I think is instrumental for the product team to help us co-create, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, and again, I think this is to the you know, detriment of some success folks, you know, we can be sort of like spastic and that we're like this thing over here and that thing over because there's sort of like a point, you know, solution. 
mm -hmm. right, to, to very specific areas, even if it's getting a lot of traction, say, in support, it's, it's hard to go to a customer, right, and say, we improved all these things, and they're like minor improvements every year, right? Yeah. I think looking at, you know, the, you know, maybe the future state and the growth-oriented stuff along mm -hmm. with, okay, like what are some areas that we need to improve in the product and feedback that we're getting with customers and theming and saying like, okay, we're going to imp improve X experience here. And this is like the benefit for the customer. And that way, you know, that allows, it does a couple of things. One, it gives you some internal marching orders and everyone sort of understands like why you're doing mm -hmm. whatever the heck you're doing, right? Like from engineering the product to us, you know, all that, all that. Two, it just like makes it a lot easier to describe to the customer, like what the heck is going on? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, guess what? We're giving you even more value. And here's like the theme and all the, you know, the tchotchkes that are part of that. Right. And it's also great from a marketing standpoint too, right? Because then they have like something to really hang their hat on and like make a big fuss over, which like we love. So um, <laughs> it's the same with sales, right? So like, I think it's just across the board. Like if you have, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of strategy there. And I think like the product team, in my experience has really helped with that. So like we can come to them and say like, Oh my God, we need, we need all this stuff. And they can say like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> take a step, back. <laughs> you know, take a sip of water and let, let's talk about like what this really means. When you say we need X, what's the experience the customer is having and what would they expect to have? And how is that connected to somewhere else you know, mm -hmm. in the product? You know, So one example might be like, oh, we have a couple of different products, but you can tell that like different product teams worked on them because like this thing is labeled this thing in this product and it's labeled something totally different in this product, right? And so that would be more of like achieving parity, right? Like just basic parity of mm -hmm. you know, quality of life stuff across your products. And that might be a theme, right? right. And that's the sort of thing that like, you know, has a huge impact on customers, whether they realize it or not. Because a lot of things, as you guys know, if it works really well, it's like almost invisible. <laughs> you know, it's intuitive, which again, like I can see why working on that might be less sexy than something big and new and all that. But, you know, it does, it does have a big impact, you know, writ large. Well, we're coming up on time. Um, I just want to say, Erica, this has been uh, very educational, as well as exciting and fun. Um, this is this is the, some of the most fun I've had on a podcast in a while. I really okay. appreciate you. you bringing all this energy, and uh, you know, I, I think that there's definitely some follow up that needs to happen uh, afterwards. You know, as we start to implement some of the things that we learn from this podcast in our own CS organization, we'll be looking to you for for support along the way. Yeah, I like that expansion room. We have to have a conversation about about that <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's learning from you already. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, sounds yeah, good, guys. This was, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for inviting me. Awesome. Well, we All appreciate right. that. I hope you can. Well, uh, hope you and the rest of the the folks at Privy can stay above water as we get into. <laughs> the holiday season and all oh, yeah. the craziness that yeah. comes. We've done this a bunch. We have a plan. Watch, we'll get like a torrent, but like. <laughs> but yeah, we're good. <laughs> Love to hear it. Hey, everybody, be sure to like and subscribe as we are always told to remind you all by our marketing team. <laughs> <laughs>